Welcome to the Transforming Assessment Series. This session is for the 5th of August. We'll be looking today at adapting to COVID-19 by ignoring proctoring. And our special uh, guest today is Magnus Nyham from uh, University of Bergen in Norway. So Magnus, would you like to begin, please? Sure can do. Hi, everyone. Good morning from Bergen, Norway. Nice summer weather, 13 degrees and heavy rains. So this is Norway summer for you. Um, work at the University of, uh, of Bergen here on the west coast of Norway. I've been working on digital assessment for the past uh, six years. Former project manager for implementing digital assessment, currently working on sort of ed tech in the broader spectrum. Um, and very happy to be here to, to share some of our insights from, from our COVID response, but also looking at how we've uh, sort of utilized digital assessment as a disruptive technology uh, to catalyze the alignment of teaching and learning. Um, I'm a microbiologist by training, as everyone who works in digital assessment do. Uh, I've had a sneak peek at the sign-up sheet, so I know about half of you are or sort of, or at least from the registration uh, fractions. You, half of you are, are teachers and half of you are sort of uh, the uh, su support staff in, in learning labs and such. Uh, what I wondered before I started, and I was going to use this feature that Matthew just introduced, is if you work at the university where you already have implemented digital assessment systems, something that's helping you to do that, hit the happy symbol. If you don't, or if you're in the process of doing so, hit the sad symbol. Right, looks about half and half. Sorry? Yeah, I need to scroll down the list. It takes a little bit of a delay sometimes for the icons to show up, I see. <laughs> there's an angry so there's, signal. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's a summary at the, at the top. If you, okay. or at least I can see a summary at the top. All right, thank you. You can, you can choose to, to undo those if you, if you prefer, or you can keep them there, I don't mind. Uh, that's at least a good setup. That means that uh, what I will cover today will both be interesting for both parties, I, I think. Uh, as Matthew said, feel free to to post questions in the uh, in the chat or in other ways uh, get our attention with raising your hand throughout. Or we'll have some Q and A afterwards as well if you would like to. So uh, um, to bring things back to to being a microbiologist, um, obviously this springs to mind when looking at the current situation, the COVID virus here on my left, and the Canvas logo on the right. It's also our LMS, this Canvas open source version of it, and I mean, I, I would definitely say there are distinct similarities there, and one could say that this is a, a push towards more formative assessment uh, using Canvas as a, an assessment platform. Jokes aside, um, and it's really bad with this, you can't really feed the response. Uh, this is the short summary of what I summarized this talk in, in about three minutes. So this is our COVID response. These are dates in March uh, and how we dealt with this at the University. Of Bergen. So I work at the University Learning Lab and we established a task force on the 10th uh, of March, which was three days before lockdown in Norway hit, and basically said, will we have partial lockdown scenario one, will we have sort of an intermediate uh, higher level of lockdown, or will we be completely locked down soon, which was scenario three. Quickly did we realize that this is definitely the case in Norway, so we, the entire country, as you can see on the 12th, campus shut down and the country pretty much closed down on the 13th. But we had a lot of, a lot of, uh, it's the wrong word, but at least we had three days head start in order to getting our affairs in order. So we analyzed what tools we needed to establish, which were interactive tools like Cultura and Zoom. We re-evaluated our course on, on online teaching for, for COVID. Uh, and then we had a lot of information sent to the faculties, department, and individuals. This was obviously a time of great distress among uh, not just teaching and learning stuff, but people had to you know, bring their kids home from school and everything. Um, the sort of big thing in terms of assessment in this was on the 13th, we uh, established this faculty digital front runners group. And we've been working with a lot of different teachers in the past years, uh, but we're looking forward to, or we were sort of trying to figure out how we can utilize their connections in the different faculties. So, so we established a front runners group, which are sort of the, peer, the, the front runners or the spareheads of, of each faculty uh, to discuss issues. And one of the issues that came up very quickly was what do we do with assessment? 
and very well summarized. Um, these slides take a bit of time before they show up. I'm worried if I click twice. Oh, there we are. Um, this was the response we, we got. Can we just keep using Inspira, which is our assessment system, as we normally do? Uh, so from all the fears of, of how to deal with assessment and all of these things, luckily there was an inbuilt sort of we already have this covered and assessment was that stressful although summarizing this to you now it's not really giving you any part of the whole picture so what i'll do is try to tell you the story of how we got to the point where we can say this and then speak a little bit about the ways we used to do assessment during covid as well let's see yeah let's start from the beginning and i'm going to do something i've never done before um, this slide is titulated, you can't do that here, which is sort of the short term of that video, and it's also you can't show videos on this system. So if you go into bit.ly slash Norwegian system and watch the video, I'll do it at the same time, so we'll start about at the same time. Two minutes, 20 seconds. Uh, Matthew, could you post a link in the chat as well? Uh, perhaps, and then I'll see you back here in about two minutes, 20 seconds. Yeah, so you need to go to the web page, folks, and then you'll find a, a video um, on that web page that's, I think, hosted on Vimeo, if I remember. So in case folks are not sure what we're doing, we're following the link that's in the text chat. It's going to a video about the Norwegian um, assessment system and what people think of it. Yes, unfortunately, the link on the slide is not a live link. You have to go to the text chat where you'll find the link. I'll just paste it again in case somebody popped in the room the last 30 seconds. Because <laughs> unfortunately, you don't get to see the old chat. You only get to see chat from the time you logged in. Leone, do you need any help? I noticed you raised your hand. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Are we going over to that other, that link? Yes, people were supposed to go to the video and just watch it. That's fine. Um, oh, okay. Thank you so much, Matthew. Bye-bye. Right. When we have, yeah, but it was only a two minute video and you're supposed to come probably be coming back right about now anyway. So oh, okay. Thank you. So I think I'll, I'll try to pull everyone back. I apologize for the interruptions with, with people talking during the, the video, but um, if uh, you'll allow me to, to continue here and, and I'll let you watch the video again in peace at a later time, I'll try to summarize some of the contents as, as well. 
Um, as you see, or as I'll tell you now, the Norwegian system is, is definitely not as great as, as one would think. Uh, we, uh, we have a very sort of test-based system, and I guess you can summarize it very well with as soon as this test slides uh, swaps. There we go. Um, you can see that we have a very strict division traditionally between teaching and assessment. So uh, there are many reasons for this. I'll get back to some of them later and also linked to a few of our descriptions on that. Uh, but that's basically where we start when we want to digitize assessment is digitizing the uh, written exams, huge humongous exams at the end of the semester thing. So uh, just to very quickly sort of give you an overview of where we were when we started or where we are now and when we started digital assessment. UIB is about 18 and a half thousand students, 19,000 this year totally, uh, about 60,000 annual high stakes written exams. Uh, working with digitization since 2004, uh, had a program targeting educational technology from 2014 called the UIB which part of uh, was the implementation of an assessment system, which in Spera won the tender. Uh, and we also use bring your own device, which students have to bring their own devices. And on the right here, this is unfortunately Norwegian, but I uh, brought out the main point. Our vice rector of education, current and at the time, um, the this, this stated goal was 30% of written exams will be digital by 2015. Everything will be 20, digital by 2017. Uh, which was a daunting task at the time. Uh, everything is sort of a difficult challenge. In addition to, to their assessment, we also brought in Canvas, uh, open source version and running on our own uh, um, computer systems. Uh, but as you've seen in the video, and as I'll tell you now, these definitely are pushing people to adapt different types of both teaching and assessment strategies, which we don't really support uh, the policies and practices. That we're doing. Um, yeah, so some of the quotes uh, the present, which was at the time in application, will always use the school exam, the strong student rights, although we do have a national wide student information system as a backbone, but you can't do that here. Mentality was, was really widespread. As I talked about the digital shift, adapting to and using technology, uh, trying to do that while we're doing a cultural shift. Uh, with also new incentives, but the reaction was pretty much all, not all across the board, but quite everywhere. Digitize, pardon the language, who the hell are you to tell me how to change the things, change the things I've always done. Uh, this is a direct quote from a teacher to me during the implementation process. So hopefully this, uh, if you can see what we've done in the end, this is where we started as well. Perhaps you can recognize some of the challenges. Um, let me break down the digital assessment elephant for you um, and how we dealt with that. Actually, I'll turn my video off. Seems like my connection is a bit iffy. So there are steps, uh, very simple to uh, to digitize the set. Uh, go big or go home, digitize the paper. Uh, four easy steps to implement digital assessments. You get them up. You purchase a system through whichever tender rules that you need to have. Clicked this many times. Come on. Uh, yeah, purchase a space or have a space enough, fill it with computers or bring your own devices. Uh, employ enough people to keep it running. And that's not really step four. Uh, it's simple to digitize how you're currently doing it. Um, but we, I would say, at least perhaps we should not continue doing what we've always done based on the video and all the other things I said as well, perhaps not the best way to enhance learning. Um, so phase two, find the magic number and fence off the distractions. And I'll tell you that uh, the magic number has something to do with digitization status. And the magic number is 69%. And then you ask what in, what, what is this number? Where does it come from? Well, it, it's about the adhering to the everything perspective that my vice director said. So these are our implementation rates of digital assessments from the spring of 2015 to the spring of 2017. Uh, and the continuation here, I should have had less transitions, fewer so so much easier. Uh, see, so in the fall 2017, we had 67% of oh, 74%. God in heavens. My apologies. 
There we go. Here comes the 69 part. So what we did as part of the project was to analyze all our courses at the university with the tools available in the assessment system at the time and say what is the maximum possible digitization rate that we can find at the university. So which there are some courses which cannot be digitized. Uh, so what we see here, that's 69%. And then if you have special characters and sketches, you get it to 73. If you add formulas to that, so math and science and economy and such, you get to 87. And if you also add third party software, you get to 96. And although if you can solve multiple uh, ex exams across the world at the same time, you get to 100. Um, the beauty of this is that when she says everything, we can say, well, 81% isn't 100%, but 81 out of 69 is 117%. So it was a nice way for our head of university to say, well, we did 117% of our exams. Easy math right there. Uh, recommend doing the same thing. They were at least very happy. But obviously, 100% isn't 100% in where you need to, uh, to go. Come on, slide 37. We can do this. There we go. Uh, so instead of just going for digitization rate, what we have done and sort of our policy throughout was to encourage and support implementation and just say it's doing the same thing as you do and collaborate on development together with the faculties department and individuals. We didn't force anyone to change their assessment. We let it sort of run its course without people making teach them everything in the appropriate way. So this was sort of a general adaptation of, of what we often saw. What do you want when it comes to changing your assessment? We don't know. We definitely want it right now. So we become rather well uh, uh, acquainted with dealing with faculty which don't really know what they're doing, but heard something really cool at the conference uh, or such. So I'll go through a few examples of these as well and how we solve them. So we have want the students to compile code. We want the students to write in LaTeX. We want the students to use an online dictionary, and we want students to sketch on a computer. Uh, the Department of Economics, this was the biggest hindrance ever. They need to be able to write simple graphs. So three simple questions, which I've come to return to as sort of a mantra when dealing with or speaking together or in dialogue with faculty. Are the students learning what they should learn? So do you have appropriate learning outcomes for your course on what they're learning? So, then are you teaching the students in the way that ensures that they learn what you want them to learn? Which means if you want them to sketch on a computer, do you actually team to sketch on the computer? Is that something they do? And then lastly, which is what they're asking me to do, can I help, can I help you assess the students drawing on the computer in the way that they want? Um, and the answer to sketching on the computer? Just sketch on paper, we'll scan it and add it to the thing. I mean, they, you, you've, there, there is no one, no one actually trained in, in sketching on the computer. It's not some part of the learning outcomes, not part of the tool package that you give the students. So this is the solution for us. And I guess that's one example. Uh, phase three, the final hurdles, 100% equals 100%. Um, from the chat here that, so who, someone was confused about the 69% measure. Uh, Robin, I'll just quickly summarize that for you, or summarize that again, perhaps others as well are wondering. Um, so what we did was basically go through every course at the university and uh, talk to the faculty asking, what's the reason you haven't digitized your course yet? So it was actually the remainder of the courses. Uh, and get feedback on what type of functionality do they need to, um, to digitize their assessment, uh, also talking trying to discuss this learning aspect of, of things, uh, which basically brings out the metrics of 69%, which uh, at the time, 69% of the exams at the university uh, could be digitized through uh, our current functionality in the R assessment system at the time. Um, yeah, so 100% equals 100%. This is uh, another example of, of things that we've had to deal with. We want the students to be able to write latex in, in mathematics. 
uh, coming back to the three simple questions again, are they learning what they should learn? Um, co comes out that there is no training whatsoever in LaTeX in the whole bachelor's degree in mathematics, but they're expected to write their thesis in, in LaTeX. Um, so basically what we ended up doing for an intro course in, in elementary calculus, uh, we utilize the, the same technology, but we had the, all the questions digital. This is what it looks like. You have a compendium on the left, which is sort of uh, the attachment paper that you could, you could bring, some, some like a cheat sheet of formulas and such. Questions are written in LaTeX here, and the students can choose to either input their response uh, as a text in this regard uh, underneath, or they can choose to write it on paper like they would normally do. Uh, yeah, another example here, instead of having a text box, this is actually a, a MATLAB code editor, so you can uh, you can write it out in coding instead. And did it work? I mean, the four out of five participants were very satisfied. The author had some issues with including LaTeX, but they were in general very satisfied. The graders had a drastic 40% reduction in grading time, according to her own accord. The local admin had a lot of new things to learn, but they figured it out, and we scanned about 1,500 sketches in less than two hours with very few errors and attaching them to the student's submission, um, which was uh, some logistics here, but, but it works out nicely. The challenge here, I guess, is the one out of five parts and the one that aren't mentioned here are the students. Uh, so I apologize for this being in Norwegian, but you can uh, it goes from very good to very bad at the, on, on the graph. But the experience was, uh, was pretty much <laughs> split across the middle. But if you notice, there were 10 participants saying it was good and 9 participants saying it was bad. So we're a little bit above average uh, happiness with this. So we continued doing it. Probably would have done anyway, but at least it's a metric to pull up. And uh, we can see that students mostly did it by hand. 66% of the students did it mostly by hand, uh, although one student actually wrote everything digitally. Um, and this is what that would look like. It's a very zoomed out view. Um, you can recognize the uh, appendix and the question in the bit, in middle. Uh, you also see that the student wrote something in the text box, and you can see the attached uh, writing there on the, uh, uh, at the bottom, which is the hand drawing, which has been scanned and attached to the, to the question. Um, yeah, uh, this student that only wrote uh, digitally, you can see that he used the comments function in the MATLAB code to write what he wanted to write in words, and then he wrote the MATLAB code as he was supposed to do at the end of that specific question. Um, I guess that's all fine and good. It worked for this course. The better question is, is this what we want it to look like? Um, it's definitely the best way to digitize mathematics currently. They don't have, we've been working with them now since as well, this was two years ago, uh, and they're working on trying to figure out what level of digital competencies the students should have and what type of digital tools the students in mathematics should be able to handle at the end of their bachelor's or master's degree. Although currently, and I guess that's what they're saying, I, when I teach mathematics, I use a blackboard and I use a piece of paper. It's like, well, why should we digitize and force you to use a digital pen? if that's not the tools you use in your everyday life when you're done doing this. So assessment shouldn't be there for change. We should be a compliment for uh, and help them out with what, we, what they need to do. Um, Nicola, that's, uh, we use Inspera assessment at University of Bergen to do this. Uh, yeah. Okay. So probably the more interesting part, I guess, uh, this is the, the introduction of how we got here. Uh, supporting digital learning, there's a lot of fancy words of how to do that. Uh, but we're going to do this experiment again, and you're going to go to this URL and click this, or yeah, go to this URL, which will be pasted in the chat. Watch this reflection on alternative assessment methods at UIP. And I'd be very happy if we can keep dialogue, if you have issues in the chat, so people can watch it in peace. And I'll see you back here in about 3 minutes, 14 seconds. Sorry, I was a bit slow on the link, <laughs> um, but you could have got it from the page I pasted in much, much earlier. <laughs>
Right, I think I'm going to try to pull you back. Hopefully most of you have already completed the, the video. Um, if you haven't, please feel free to rewatch it at a later stage. If you didn't catch that we were actually going to an external link to watch the video, then also feel free to rewatch it later. The link will be in the slides. It's also linked on the page that we will, uh, where the uh, summary will be. Um, yeah, so as Knut said at the end, it's easier to do what you've always done. And I've seen some reactions in the in the chats uh, about the rudimentariness of, of assessment. And I guess that speaks a bit to, to how it's done. It's, we've been a research, research heavy institution, focus on teaching and learning hasn't necessarily been the priority throughout the past decades. And this is definitely then something that we need to address and that we're currently addressing. So I'll speak a little bit more about that now. Try to speed up a bit, might skip a few uh, pieces uh, along the way. Uh, again, again, back to, to what do you want when it comes to doing new types of assessment then. A few more examples. Uh, the online dictionary, um, do you have? Do they, there was, there's a lot of back and forth of how we wanted to deal with this. Uh, in the end, the students don't have a learning outcome to use a dictionary. The only reason they should do it was for them to know how to bring the book and then not have to do the control check in the exam hall. Uh, and for a long, long while, we just said bring the, the physical book in the end. Uh, there's also been a digitized new version of the Norwegian Online Dictionary, which now also has an exam version, which means it doesn't have all the additional things which uh, uh, an online dictionary would help you with. So we worked with this, the, the developers here to actually develop an assessment version of their, their online dictionary. Uh, and then lastly, in terms of uh, things they wanted, they wanted the students to compile code. This is probably the most asked for thing from the computer science department for, for such a long time. Uh, so what do the students say to write a compiling code and are they learning what they should learn? Uh, so we had a, a large open meeting with a bunch of the students and a bunch of the teachers from the Department of Informatics and Computer Science. and. To everyone's surprise, the students weren't happy with having to, in a three-hour exam, write comma perfect code. They were probably more reflected than the teachers in terms of the skills and knowledge that they wanted to be tested on in a written exam and, I mean, supported the idea of doing this as a separate assessment. This assessment of, of uh, comma perfect code is not the best done as a written final exam with a three-hour time, but perhaps more as a formative thing throughout the semester. So in the end, they don't still not get to compile any code. They get to do that elsewhere. Um, let me tell you a story. Uh, it's a quick story. It's a bit, it says a little bit about how we started this. Certain. There's two characters in the story. Let's one of them called them Magnus, and the other one's called Rob. And Rob was an American guy coming from the from the U.S working with teaching and learning, definitely knowing how things should be done, coming to Norway, teaching a course, enhancing your course with Canvas. We just introduced Canvas. And in, in this course, there was this guy, let's call him Magnus. And whenever Rob said something fun uh, that you could do in Canvas, Magnus said, you can't do that here. You're not allowed to do that here. The rules and regulations don't allow you to do that here. So after a while, Rob got pretty annoyed and said, but what can you do? And uh, Fast forward a few years, that meant that Magnus and Rob was running a project together, was the teaching and learning in the digital age project, uh, which is one that we just actually completed here, uh, which was a collaboration then between uh, myself and the uh, head of the university pedagogy unit, Robert Gray, uh, where we actually redesigned and evaluated at least 20 courses across the university in terms of utilizing technology for teaching and learning and enhancing it uh, when also learning outcomes were uh, properly aligned uh, with assessment of teaching. Um, yeah, I just saw that. How appropriate. Uh, what we did in this part was basically creating a course redesign process. This is not something that was uh, prominent at the, at the time. Uh, and you can reread this later if you like. It basically brings, summarizes up to these three questions. Again, the three simple questions. Are they learning what they should learn? Are we teaching the students in a way? And are they assessing them in an appropriate way? Um, we also wanted to do some evaluation on this. So not only introducing a change for teaching, but also introducing SOTL as a way to evaluate this. Um, I won't probably go through all of the examples. Uh, I'll, ha I'll let you through, read this through. I'll very quickly say that they changed it from a lot of written exams to different types of assessment 
forms. So even the portfolio, uh, less lectures in Isabella went to flip classrooms, uh, Bodil went to more quizzes, more formative assessment throughout, more, more discussion based, uh, more sort of hands on use of uh, cartography tools in, in Gitsky's course in, in geography. Uh, Henriette, which you also saw in the movie, uh, more sort of formative assessment throughout the semester. Uh, I'll just skip to the end of these. Uh, as we said, the, the slides will be posted uh, or are already posted, actually, so feel free to review those. Uh, but notice that none of them mention digital exams. So what we learn from this sort of, well, having an administrative push mainly for, for digitizing assessment uh, doesn't really improve quality, although working together with the teachers and helping them utilize new digital tools for assessment really did drive uh, this uh, forward. Uh, as part of this as well, I already talked about two things that uh, didn't work out in the video, uh, that was the blockers for, for assessment. Uh, we've identified, I was about to say seven, but it's eight, isn't it? Um, which is in this report is also linked as only in the region, but you can Google translate that PDF should uh, be able to look at it. But then one of them is basically the assessment system and routines and 100% digitization assessment, which was what I was asked to do in the, at the time was to digitize all of assessment. Well, I can't do that if I don't solve all the seven other ones. So there's a lot of challenges regarding the digitization of assessment, which has nothing to do with the assessment system as itself, which we are addressing now. Um, part of that and part of the ongoing work that we have been doing is developing the a learning community and forging a learning lab, um, which is where I currently work. Uh, so the learning lab, I guess you can call it whatever you want, Center for Teaching and Learning, Excellence in Higher Education, something, something, or same, so, uh, so it's all, all same names for the same type of structure, but at least we support teachers in, in many different areas in terms of developing their teaching and have been scaling up. So currently, interdisciplinary knowledge uh, when experts in educational development, pedagogy, educational technology, media production, how to handle all the rules and regulations governing teaching and learning in Norway, uh, and lifelong learning. And um, current mission statements, basically looking at developing teaching practices, uh, redesigning courses and programs, utilizing technology and communicating knowledge from research and education as well. And um, this is, I guess, where I, I've been coming in now in terms of development. Currently, we have a learning design uh, development. I work in the educational de technology development and implementation. Uh, we also have some uh, science communication and learn uh, sort of more technical uh, learning object repository sharing of, of learning resources and work going on. So, to, that's all the background story, so we can start talking about what it said in the title, which was COVID, and how we dealt with that. And I already spoiled it at the beginning that we, were, we did rather well. I would, it's it's self-evaluation, right? So we can always say we did rather well, and then someone else has to correct that. Um, but uh, this gift of play, it looks a lot better when he plays, but just assume he's uh, wailing his arms in his head. Uh, the teacher comfort with no lockdown browsers uh, was panic, I guess. Uh, although uh, Inspire assessment and, and using the assessment tool was nice, uh, they've always been able to send the students to an exam hall where they can uh, where lock them down and control what they're doing and have old people sit and stare at them while they're doing their exams. Uh, and then very quickly, I guess, proctoring came up on the table and we um, very quickly shut it down again. So there's several reasons for this. First, uh, there is no proctoring by law. So proctoring at home would be video surveillance, and that's treating personal and privacy data. That requires a legal foundation in law or consent. There is currently no legal foundation for this in Norwegian law. Uh, and if we were to ask for consent, it requires it to be voluntary. And if it's supposed to be voluntary, then saying no to it should cannot give you any negative consequences. So as sitting in an exam is a right, as a student, no consent equals no exam equals negative consequence. So by law, we are not allowed to do video proctoring over students. If, and this is a hypothetical, which I've been told, we, uh, the students would be paying to come here, as in, to, not tuition-based, but as in we pay for the study point specifically, 
uh, we could perhaps do it by law uh, in the Norwegian system currently. Um, I'll come back to the questions, if that's fine, from both Jan and Claudia, if that's fine, uh, I'll, I'll note those. Um, no proctoring by fairness. Um, we saw or we evaluated video proctoring from home, so the students sitting there uh, to be it's easy to cheat with. You can have notes outside your video range. You can have a helper outside the camera range. What do you, what happens when you need to take a break? You can go to the to the bathroom, or if you need to go out and get some air, or any other way of more genius ways of cheating than what I could list at this uh, short time. Uh, either way, we could never control the fair uh, the fairness of it. So, or I guess integrity would be a better word. Coming back to your question, Claudia. Um, and then, I guess, no proctoring by quality, so we could never really uh, assure that the students got a fair a chance of taking the exams when everyone's sent home. Perhaps you have two small children that don't have a kindergarten to go to during COVID and all these things. Um, so we basically said, well, you're not allowed to do that either. Um, this is actually the recommendations that we sent out in terms of dealing with cheating and plagiarism and integrity. Uh, intendedly short and precise. We don't need people to have a lot of options. We need them to do make good good choices in a in a stressful time. So the first would be to redesign their assessment so the student cannot benefit from communicating or using researchers on the internet. If you were to look at the Bloom's taxonomy of learning, that would basically asking the more appropriate questions, which we either way should be asking. So I guess as a driver for for better teaching and learning. Uh, there were some, or quite a bit of them, who changed it, uh, the grading scale to do a pass fail rather than an A to F uh, to reduce the, the pressure. Uh, and uh, we also have obviously, uh, functionality for plagiarism, but also new functionality in, in the assessment system where you can students can draw X task out of a pool of tasks to reduce the impact of dialogue. Um, again, coming back to these three questions. And if you go on the link, uh, this is linked on the web page and on that link and in the slides as well. But this is basically the foundation of what we looked at. It's very small on my screen, but we made a flow chart basically saying you need to put your exam online um, to sort of help teachers in their thought process of changing their exams. So firstly, I'll, I'll walk you through it, it's fine. Uh, have you assessed your students already? Um, enough have you assessed the learning outcomes well if you do just reweigh those and you're done if you haven't can you redesign your course uh, assessment to assess them differently um, hopefully you can here are several options that you can do you can do a live oral exam we recommend using zoom you can do an offline oral exam using Kaltura. you can write a reflection paper traditional home exam etc etc uh, which is where the, the arrows are at in terms of on the right side. If you have to keep your exam, we want to make sure that you're sure on that because integrity is very hard to ensure in high stakes exams, as several have pointed out also in the chat. But if that's the case, then we recommend doing a semi-synchronous exam. So this is coming back to the fairness, so saying that the students can start an exam whenever they want in this time, and then they have X amount of hours to complete it, uh, rather than having them all start at nine o'clock because perhaps you won't be able to be there at nine o'clock. Um, yep. Who's talking? No one's talking. Okay, then I'll continue talking. Um, I, I, I must state that I haven't followed the chat at this point, so if there's any new questions, please repost them. <laughs> uh, or I can scroll up later. Okay, uh, I'll wrap, wrap this up just talking very quickly about how we use the digital assessment as a disruptive technology and if it actually had an impact. And then we can have some questions at the end. So um, in terms of has it had an impact? Uh, I would say yes. So these are uh, the relative use of assessment types at the university going from 2006 to 2018. And if I just click next, it will say, bam, that we 
uh, after 2015, which is when we started implementing digital assessment in Inspera, we implemented Canvas and ULMS, and obviously started working a lot with the faculties and teachers in terms of rethinking what they're doing in, uh, in terms of teaching and learning, uh, we see a significant drop in the use of written exams. And we're almost to the point where it's no longer the biggest assessment type at the University of Bergen. Uh, which, to be fair, looks like it might have some impact, although there's a lot of other things happening in this, uh, this uh, time as well, obviously. Uh, so we're not going to give it a definite yes that this is caused by the introduction of digital assessment, although we definitely see that there has been changes since the introduction of that. It's in prep, we're working on getting some more data out on that. Uh, although research says this process from 2015 40% uh, of faculty lack the knowledge of how to use alternative assessment methods. I'm surprised it's such a low number. I would say I would have guessed it would be higher. 20%-ish lack digital competencies. Yep, we've come to notice that. Uh, and 90% of faculty claim that it was too fast, uh, which I'm happy that 81% of the faculty claim that it was, wasn't too fast. We can flip that on this head, and I would actually be very content with the number 81%. Um, where has this left us? We're working on continuous development of, of digital exams. They're running as they should be. We also have uh, through the Office of Student Affairs, but with the, the UIB Learning Lab is working on sort of improving and, and thinking differently in terms of digital assessment. Uh, collaboration is key. So this is basically the three simple questions. Just to rephrase this, how can we in the UAB Learning App support you in making sure that the three simple questions? Uh, and this is also coming back to, to working with the teachers throughout COVID with, with the front runners group, where we saw that uh, FaceTime with teachers and when we actually sit down and talk to them, we can resolve a lot of the issues and also identifying the correct stakeholders and, and sort of, uh, what do you call it? Pion not the pioneers, it has a fancy word in Norwegian that I can't translate currently, the people that will impact others' opinions, uh, which has helped us a lot in sort of getting the new things, through, at least through COVID across. Um, just some highlights very quickly at the end, influencers perhaps, yeah. Um, we have an ongoing development of the assessment ecosystem. So this is coming back to all the questions about the systems that we use and such. Inspira assessment, I guess, for summative assessments, what we've spoken most about. We also use Canvas. We also have two other uh, systems for, for dissertation and thesis. But uh, creating sort of an ecosystem where all these integrate and use the same integration makes it simple and predictable to use. So for example, everyone uses the same method of detecting plagiarism, whichever system it, the, the text originates from. Um, we are working, oh, well, I love love charts, by the way. Um, we're working on the third party portal, which is basically how to pro provide students with applications for teaching and learning. Uh, and I could spend four hours talking about this. So if you have any specific questions on this specifically, I can go back to you, but it's basically how to provide uh, licensed software to students, both during teaching and in a lockdown environment in exams. Um, program and course redesign models, coming back to the Toledo points, uh, is the left is Texas A&M that we've taken a lot of inspiration from their course uh, program redesign model, which we are adapting to, to Norway and obviously all, all over the place in, in a general scope, redesigning and aligning professional development in pedagogy and ed tech use and, and trying to help and support teachers in, in using technology to enhance learning. Yeah, and we're gonna 100% digitize all our exams this fall for the first time ever. 100% equals 100%, yay. All right, I apologize for running a little bit long. But we have a bunch of uh, minutes for questions, and I would be happy to take any of them. I could scroll up in the chat, but we will. Uh, I think if you could, if you have a question that I haven't answered, just please just post it uh, in the chat again, or or raise your hand, and we can get to them as soon as we can. While you're typing and or raising your hand, I'll answer Mike's question. Uh, I what if they don't consent to live oral Zoom exam? I'm not sure. Sh I, we haven't discussed that, although it's not recorded and it's in the interest of the student, so I guess they would have to ask uh, or apply for a different assessment method in that regard. 
uh, Sian, what Inspira products are we using? So for our setup, uh, I was about to say all of them, which is necessarily true, but we use the core Inspira assessment product. We use the scanning solution that they have, obviously the lockdown browser with uh, safe exam browser for the students, BYODs, uh, the analytics model. Are there anything specific that you're asking about or is it? Uh, um, no, I was just, um, yeah, just was the lockdown browser, really. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we locked down with Safe Exam Browser. I know they have a they have their own product being developed, which we are evaluating if we should use Inspira Seb rather than normal Safe Exam Browser. So. Um, slides, we can post a link for Claudia. Nick, we have used the lockdown browser remotely, but not as a COVID response. So we've done that for... Uh, doing simultaneous assessment on different geographical locations where the students have to go or they have to find someone who can to, who can proctor their own exams. These are in, in very rare specific cases. For example, if the student is currently in jail. Uh, why, do stu why do students object to online proctoring? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if they do, we haven't asked them. Uh, but we uh, basically said that we have no legal grounds to do online proctoring. Uh, so we didn't offer them the option of having an opinion. Um, uh, do, uh, from Mike, do staff use, uh, get trained in developing multiple choice response questions? CAA, I'm not sure what that stands for. Um, as soon as questions, we, uh, we, we do not train them in that, although I know that specifically at the medical faculty, they do a lot of, of multiple choice questions and they have a national multiple choice question bank, which has quality control and analytics built into it. So I assume they have some, some training in, in that. Uh, computer aid assessment. Uh, no, yeah, we don't train them in that. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the reassured by proctoring by, by Neil comment. So students can be reassured by proctoring the perceived peers less likely to cheat. Uh, yes, no, and maybe, um, although I would imagine the students also would be very inventive in the ways of potentially cheating and that itself could be, could be an issue. Some media that we've had is that that students try to cheat the safe exam browser and, and that's become a big uh, sort of media issue where they fear that stu other students might cheat. All right, um, my email and contact info is in the slide deck. Uh, so feel free to get in touch if there's anything that I want you want me to elaborate on. If you want to get in touch or learn more from us, I'd be happy to talk to you. And I think I'm going to pass back to Matt. If there is nothing else, no more questions as far as I can see. Yeah, we still got five minutes, so people don't have to rush off if they don't want to. You're welcome to ask more questions. Um, I am typing in the feedback survey link, so if you have yet to fill it in, um, we'd like to have this done every day. It will help every session. Um, it helps us improve and it gets feedback to the speaker as well. Certainly proctoring has, is a hot topic um, in many places. It's been a hot topic in Australia in the sense that it's hot and cold and hot and cold. Um, people have decided to implement it or not. Um, we ran a webinar uh, several months ago in May, I think it was, from the folks at uh, University of New England who'd done, I think, one of the better implementations of remote proctoring in Australia. And it was a five-year process. Um, I think it was a, it's a matter of um, careful monitoring, careful change management, careful expectations. Uh, yep. Right. Yes, thanks, right. Um, I think there is, um, you know, a valid place for things like that. Personally, I think there's a valid place for it, but you have to be careful about the way you introduce it. Um, in Australia, it's not illegal, so we have that. <laughs> it's not against the law, um, so we do have the option. Um, but at the same time, rushing it in, um, is going to get some blowback from your community, um, like rushing in most new forms of innovation. 
could I ask to, to the general community then is sort of what why why proctoring over uh, over assessment methods which better better assess the students' learning outcomes? Or is this proctoring on already validated assessment methods and that's the only way to do assessment or the absolute best way to do it? I think there's a lot of reasons why you know, proctoring is seen as a seen as a sort of a panacea in the sense that a you don't have to change your assessment, so it's seen as easy in inverted commas, but it's not, in my opinion. Um, there, yes, Ray has pointed out a very good point. Um, uh, accreditation bodies, so you know, uh, engineers, accountants, uh, you know, law societies, etc have accreditation requirements and often those re inquire, require invigilated assessments. Um, scalability in Australia, it's quite common to have um, classes with 2,000 students in them um, and doing much more authentic, richer forms of workplace-based assessments, not necessarily scalable. So exams are seen as scalable. Um, you know, there, there's, I think that the cultural uh, economic, um, there's many reasons why change to online proctoring can be as, uh, seen as preferred or slow or not applicable. So, I, th you know, I, I, I think it's horses for courses and ultimately you need to mix up your assessment methods. I'm certainly somebody who likes to try and promote alternative assessment methods where I can. Um, but there is that balance needed between you know what is scalable and cost effective, what what carries a a degree of uh, of in, you know, uh, authentication or integrity to the assessment system. You know, if all assessments were take home assessments, how do we know that they're not being contract cheated out? How do they know that the students are not paying somebody else to do it? So you know, people see things like online proctoring as as a backstop to um, to to um, you know, protecting the integrity of the assessment system. Um, in the past, we've sort of suffered from, you know, uh, examinations and increasingly not being very authentic forms of assessment. But if we, I think if we introduce, you know, um, or allow people to use online proctoring, then they don't, we're not necessarily locked into a quiz. We could ask the students to use all sorts of bits of software and be monitored while they're doing it. So I think it potentially opens the door to, to more authentic tasks within the supervised invigilated context via digital means. So, uh, you know, I think there's, it has its places, but it requires a lot of um, gentle introduction and thought and resourcing. <laughs> so. Yeah, it, it appears to me, I mean, I'm sure it, proctoring has a place. It's just, I don't think it's, uh, or I, I get the, I, from hearing, hearing this and reading the chat and speaking to others, I get the idea that, that they have, it's the solution. I think no, it's not the solution to assessment. I think it just, it, it, it's a blind, uh, what's it called? Blind way, the the wrong way in terms of assessment, in terms of getting it authentic. But it definitely has uses, as pointed out, for accrediting and, and, and these things, if necessary, if you have to do remotely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. All right, I'm just pasting the text, um, the feedback sync link. So if you've yet to fill in the feedback survey, please do it. And we're right on time. So thank you very much, folks. Um, just to let you know, our next session for the 2nd of September is on iLearn Insights. It's a, it's a um, how to say, a, a, an analytics uh, intervention style system uh, that works in collaboration with Moodle. Um, I've learned more about it since I've become a Macquarie University staff member as well. So um, this was planned before I came to Macquarie, so it's not quite nepotism, but um, I learned Insights won an Ascolite Award uh, last year or the year before. Um, so it'll be an interesting session to see how uh, that system is being used for engagement and personalization um, interventions of, of stu for students. So thanks very much, folks. And thanks very much, Magnus. Uh, it's been really interesting to hear you know, stories from the other side of the world. We all have common problems, but um, hopefully we can uh, learn from each other a lot more. So thanks very much. Uh, we'll see you next month. I'm just going to.